Good day and welcome to Musing Heavy, the site devoted to alternative reflections on hard rock and heavy metal. My name is Steve Meyer and this is part three of my YouTube series entitled Punk Attitudes in Heavy Music. And in this, in this part, I'm going to ask the, the fairly provocative question, was Ted Nugent a punk? And you'll see as I go through this, in my opinion, for much of his career, absolutely yes. That I would say yes to that. Uh, now, keeping in mind, and as I've sort of talked about throughout this series, and that I'm sort of a thesis I'm developing to some degree, there is a big difference between punk in attitude and punk in style. Punk in attitude relates to an artist who is always creative, um, you, tries to be unique, um, is an individual, a strong individual you know, striving for the novel, right? Whereas punk in style relates more to the prototypical view of punk, both in appearance and sound, i.e., you know, uh, the, the spiky hair, the ripped clothing, the safety pins, that sort of thing. And the sound being very simple songs, short songs, shouty lyrics, uh, angry or, or shouty choruses, angry lyrics, that sort of thing, right? Now, when it comes to Ted Nugent, I think when it comes to punk and attitude, he checks off all the boxes. So let's dig into this and I'll try to explain why I think that. So sharing my screen, um, if you want to just read the essay, links provided below. And you can also get some links to my YouTube channel to check out the rest of this series or any of the other series that I've put together. If you're so inclined. All right. A little bit of a background here. Uh, guitar slinging punks? Is such a thing possible? Um, all right. Well, no artist crafts in a vacuum. Everyone has their inspirations to draw from, right? So no, no musician, no painter, etc. No one's 100% unique, although some really strive to go that route. But, you know, everybody has their influences to some degree. It's just that some musical acts are unmistakably the sum of their influences, whereas others seem far more unique, or they might seem even one of a kind, even if technically that is impossible. So as I've been arguing, the core of punk relates strongly with the latter idea. Um, the more an artist strives to do or be something truly different, the greater their punk and attitude quotient becomes. Okay. Although punk rock is commonly associated with, say, the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, the Clash, etc. And I've talked about all three of those bands, by the way, in parts one and two. So check that out. Um, and punk is more recently associated with groups such as The Offspring and Green Day. I'll have more to say about those types of punk bands actually coming up. Um, a strong punk in attitude designation need not be limited to only those who look and sound the part is sort of one of my central arguments, i.e. if that's punk in style. To make this point more clearly, I'm going to illustrate why Ted Nugent and also Jimi Hendrix and Eddie Van Halen, check out part four for my talk about Hendrix and Van Halen, but particularly in this episode, I'm going to illustrate why Ted Nugent maximized the punk in attitude ethic, even if almost no one would associate these types of guitar wizards with the punk trends of the late 70s and beyond. All right, so let's talk Nugent for a while. The Nuge is a mega conservative guitar wailing punk. Hmm, all right, well, for starters, okay. Full disclosure, full biases. I'm a huge fan of Ted Nugent. So that's so I'll get my biases out of the way. That's going to come across in my talk. I can't really help it anyway. My bias has just come out, right? I'm not huge on his politics and some of the things he stands for, but musically, I've got a ton of respect for Ted Nugent. Anyway, in many ways, Ted Nugent never got his due. And really, this is not surprising if we look back on his career. He constructed an image that could never have universal appeal, right? His, his approach to music and especially his interests, attitudes, and lifestyle were so at odds with what was typical of a hard rocker 
uh, that his superb guitar playing and I would argue fine songwriting skills were forever overshadowed. Now, New Joe, he, he, he's got his fans. Don't get me wrong, but widespread appeal seems kind of impossible. And before we really get rolling, and we're going to look at Ted's discography a little bit, and I'm going to point out some of the key aspects, especially really where I think he's very punk in attitude. Here's what the Nuge typically looked like throughout his career. So just two quick pictures of him. Uh, here's what Ted looked like. Uh, and I'm sort of titling these pictures, always looking, looking non-punk. I mean, you're never going to mistake Ted Nugent for Sid Vicious, are you? Um, so here's here's what Ted looked like in the 70s and in the 80s. Typically, always lots of long hair, headbands. Um, he had his little tail going on here to remind us that he's a hunter. Always wailing away on that Birdland Gibson, which nobody else was really playing that in hard rock either. Uh, he usually didn't wear any shirts or, in fact, there were times he just wore a loincloth and that's it, kind of doing the Tarzan thing. And yes, he used to swing on a rope in concert as well. Very high energy, very, you know, and especially in terms of guitar. Um, now, Ted, um, as far as his licks and riffs, weren't really that difficult, really effective. But his solos were very complicated, right? And sometimes very drawn out. Very non-punk uh, in that aspect, for sure. And here's kind of what Ted looks like nowadays. Um, he's cut the long hair, but often wears the cowboy hat, sleeveless shirts, uh, always wailing on that bird land, right? And again, looking decidedly non-punk. Here he looks kind of like a conservative dude, really, right? Um, anyway. There's there's sort of the looks of Ted. Again, admittedly in appearance, he doesn't look punk at all. And and, and I and he never did, right? All right. So, you know, uh, uh, but punk and attitude, absolutely. I'm gonna get to that. But let, let's go through his his discography a little bit here. Uh Nugent started his recording career in the late 60s. So Ted's been around a long time with the garage psychedelic band, the Amboy Dukes. I think he had some high school bands before that, but his first band of any note was the Amboy Dukes uh, out, out of Michigan. Uh, his Chuck Berry on steroids approach to licks and solos was all was already ingrained on the early Amboy Dukes album. So we have Amboy Dukes of 67, Journey to the Center of Your Mind in 68, the song actually became a bit of a hit, Migrations in 69, Marriage on the Rocks, Rock Bottom 70, and Survival of the Fittest in 1971, which was a live album. And this rip-roaring style of rhythm and blues became even heavier with Call of the Wild and Tooth, Fane, and Claw, both released in 74. Really, these last two, they're, they're, they're credited to Ted Nugent and the Amboy Dukes, but in most ways, this is the beginning of Ted's solo career. Those earlier Amboy Dukes albums, very much a group. Um, yeah, Ted was, Ted was a big voice, as he always is, but they were very much a band. Uh, maybe something approximating a democracy. Once we hit Call of the Wild, it's no democracy. Ted is the man calling the shots. And he always had good players with him, but it was Ted Nugent's band, make no mistake. Um, so as I'm saying, really these latter two were his first solo records. So the Call of the Wild and Tooth, Fane and Claw. Even if most credit the self-titled Ted Nugent album of 75, his most famous album, I would say, Stranglehold, Stormtroop, and Just What the Doctor Ordered, Queen of the Forest, Snakeskin Cowboys. I mean, a lot of his best. Sansi still plays today, actually. Um, a lot of people consider that his first solo album. I would say that's probably not true. I think the, the two before, which were also great albums, uh, were really his first true uh, solo albums. Anyway. The, the the Ted Nugent album of 75, along with Free For All, the title track, a big well-known song as his Dog Eat Dog. Um, Cat Scratch Fever, probably his most famous song, the title track of that, amongst others, of 77. And Double Live Gonzo, uh, one of the best live albums from the 70s. All of these, I think, represent Nugent's most successful period, in terms of commercially anyway. And really, this is how he built his career really on, on this era by far. It's not that he didn't go on to record other great stuff, because he did. But this is the foundation of Ted, really. Um, uh, and in a word, these albums were wild. Right? Such notoriety was well earned given the power of the songs on these albums, the ferocity of the guitar playing, always Ted's calling card, calling card is just an incredible, how incredibly uh, high octane of a guitar player he was. And the high intensities of his live shows, which could go on for hours, and he just never seemed to run out of energy. He was really something to behold. Okay, well, put that. let's put that in context. 
with the drug fueled and or hard drinking climate of the 70s infesting the vast majority of rock musicians and the apparent inhuman energy Nugent put into everything, including his interviews, which were often way over the top, too. One could be forgiven that thinking this guy must be on something and probably a whole lot of it. Right. Moreover, with much of the earlier Amboy Dukes material, and again, I'm talking when they were really a band, uh, making flagrant drug references, and with many of his co-members obviously indulging, a reasonable assumption would have been that the long-haired Nugent must surely be closely aligned with the left-leaning, substance abuse, hippie culture of the times, right? And a lot of people, I'm sure, thought that. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. Ted was the exact opposite of all that stuff, right? In hard rock circles, Nugent was an anomaly. Absolutely. He was unique in lifestyle and attitude and musically highly innovative as no one was supercharging R&B the way he was. There was nobody in hard rock playing this Chuck Berry on steroids the way Ted was. He was completely unique in music. And he was completely unique in attitude and lifestyle. Like nobody was like this guy. In other words, he was punk in attitude to the bone marrow. I don't know that anybody could be more punk in attitude, especially in this part of his career, right? Okay, I'm going to compare this to Hendrix and Van Halen in the next ap episode, who I think are even more punk in attitude because their whole careers never waver from it. But Ted, in certain parts of his career, was the epitome of punk punk and attitude that is okay in spite of overt appearances nugent was the ultimate anti-hippie and very loud about it it's not like this was a secret really or if, or if you paid attention to to you know what he was screaming about because he didn't usually talk he usually screamed he never shied away from insulting anyone who was stoned or in a drunken state which, of course, alienated him from peer musicians and indeed many music critics as well. Nugent was straight edged before this was even an accepted cultural choice for musicians. And this pretty much put him on an island, along with perhaps Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley from Kiss. Those are the only other two I could really think of that had the same high profile. But in fairness, as much as I love Kiss... Those guys never had Nugent's chops. They weren't even in his league, right? I mean, musical chops, I'm talking. In addition, Nugent noisily proclaimed his love for hunting at every opportunity and openly aligned himself with gun lobbyists. Again, who else was doing that in hard rock at that time? This was a courageous stance in some ways, but one that pitted him against the vast majority of other artists who, let's face it, if I'm, if I'm going to stereotype, most other artists tended to admire uh, veganism, be anti-war and often anti-establishment in terms of government, military, the policing, etc. That wasn't how Ted ran at all, right? As his political views became more widely known and as he poured on the bombast with increasing gusto, Nugent distanced himself even further from music institutions in general, right? Okay. So looking back, again, going through the discography even a little more, uh, such albums as Weekend Warriors, uh, State of Shock, Scream Dream, uh, Intensities in 10 Cities. So again, Ted released a lot of albums in, in short duration back then, although a lot of people in the 70s did. Um, pretty much an album a year. These albums, again, great albums, solidified his gonzoness and his hyper-aggressive hyper guitar playing. But really, it was the Nugent album that in some ways was a, a yet another turning point in his career, I think. The Nugent album was created in 1982, and especially the song Bound and Gagged uh, in particular. Um, this song brought his ultra-conservative leanings to the forefront, right? Before Bound and Gagged, he didn't really get too political with a lot of those other albums. He'd talk about hunting, living in the woods a little bit here and there. But for the most part... His political view, views, uh, which were ultra right wing conservative and still are, were pretty much kept out of his music. That's that changes around this time. Uh, no longer did Nugent leave his mega Republican rhetoric, hunting and gun rights opinions and left wing insults exclusively to interview rants. Oh, he always talked about in interviews, but he kind of kept that out of the music. That changes. 
His views now routinely in, infiltrated later career songs as well, which again, whether you agree with Ted or not, I mean, lots of people don't, and I don't really his political stance, but again, it's a very punk thing to do. He was on an island here as far as hard rockers were concerned for much of his career. So here's a few examples from songs on more his more recent albums where, where again, the political leanings or the 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 the, the over the top um enthusiasm for hunting is, is right at the forefront. It's right in the lyrics, whereas before he he didn't really talk about that in his music. So Kiss My Ass, again, you can imagine what kind of song that is. And Fred Bear, which actually is a really cool hunting song if you're into that. Both are from Spirit of the Wild. My bow and arrow from the album Hunt Music. I mean, that's pretty clear. Raw Dogs and War Hogs from the Amazing Craveman album. Again, very political. Geronimo, Geronimo and Me stand and stand from Love Grenade again, very right wing political songs. I still believe Do Rag and 45, Screaming Eagles, Semper FI, and Trample the Weak and Hurdle the Dead. Well, you titles probably tell you pretty much what they're about. This is from Shut Up and Jam, which is kind of an interesting title because he he's not just shutting up and jamming on this album, he's giving you his political rhetoric kind of full force on that album on a lot of songs. He does a little jamming too, of course. Um, more recent albums, Cock Locked and Ready to Rock, Backstreet Fever, and I Just Want to Go Hunting from The Music Made Me Do It in 2018, and Come and Take It from his latest album called Detroit Muscle. These are all, again, very political, these songs. Admittedly, though, and I should I should mention this because this is what makes Ted's a career, he's not punk in attitude all the way through. It, it, it kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. There was a period when Nugent abandoned his musical uniqueness, toned down the conservative bombast, at least on albums. He never stopped being an ultra conservative, you know, in interviews, but on the albums, he definitely did for a while. And, and, and again, I think this was deliberate. I think he knew his political views were kind of scaring some people away. And for a while, Ted wanted to be more of a pop star, I think. And he sought wider appeal via releases such as Penetrator of 1984, especially with Little Miss Dangerous. And If You Can't Lick Em, Lick Em, which is a bit of a transitional album, but still pretty poppy for Ted. And he was especially commercial with his involvement in the pop rock group Damn Yankees that had some pretty big hits on the top 40 charts, right? So this era, while quite successful commercially, at least a few of those albums were, severely dulled Nugent's punk in attitude spirit that up until then was undeniable. So again, I think for this period, this is where Ted is not particularly punk in attitude. In fact, I got to be fair here, even though I'm a Nugent fan, I don't think he was particularly innovative at all on, on those albums or that era. Yeah, he sold more albums in some ways. Um, but again, he's not really unique. In fact, he's kind of following trends. He actually started to sound at times, like he even changed his guitar tone, which I didn't think Ted would ever do, but he even started to sound a little more like Eddie Van Halen, who at that time was kind of influencing the planet of guitar players. He even using Eddie's uh, 5150 amps and all that sort of stuff. He pulls out of this, but again, you know, he, he's being influenced from the outside, which Ted never did before. So I, I think his punk and attitude portion is going way down here. Um, and interestingly, uh, in some ways, the Nuge has several commonalities with the Ramones. And I talk about the Ramones actually in the last episode, if you want to check that out. In that, the earliest material is definitely the most innovative. So I think this is with Ted, and it's also was true with the Ramones, as I talked about. So with Ted, at least, that, and that, that's a pretty big period where he was super innovative and really punk in attitude. That lasted from the, 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 the late 60s and into the 70s for sure. But then a more commercialized approach is pursued for a while before returning to his core sounds. The Ramones did the same thing. They kind of courted more mainstream audiences. They weren't as successful as Ted was, but they sort they did do that. And then they returned to their core sounds. And that's as we'll, and that's sort of what Ted does too. And also like the Ramones. Nugent's more recent records continue to be in a category all of their own. So nobody, still nobody to this day sounds like Ted Nugent. But here's the thing. He has not been able to avoid considerable amounts of self-plagiarizing. Okay, so just like I talk about with the Ramones, nobody really sounded like the Ramones through their, their whole career, at least not convincingly. I mean, yeah, they had their copiers, but nobody really sounded like them. But I would argue 
Punk and attitude is about all trying to be creative all the time, trying to be novel as much as you can. So just because you're not following someone else's trends, even if you're following your own blueprint, your punk and attitude quotient goes down as far as I'm concerned. And that's kind of what's happened with Ted in the latter years. Yeah, nobody still sounds like Ted on Detroit Muscle, but now he's kind of just sounding like he always is sound. He's not giving us anything new. So he's not as punk and attitude as he used to be, as far as I'm concerned. So arguably the last remnants of true guitar innovation coupled with overt conservatism and hunting activism, as always, in the lyrics occur around the point of Spirit of the Wild and Crave Man and maybe a little bit into Love Grenade, the next one, with subsequent releases breaking little new ground. Thus, as with the Ramones, Nugent also experienced a decline in punk and attitude during his twilight years, which he's which where he's at now by producing good yet predictable recent albums. And in just a quick way to summarize that, if, if if to make the point another way, I suppose. So I made a little graph here and I'm calling it Ted Nugent's punk and attitude temporal journey. And I think there's so, so again, Ted's been around a long time. So since the late sixties and he's still going today, he's not touring anymore. Uh, he kind of made that announcement, I think about a year ago, but he still probably do one-off shows and he still says he's going to still record new material. So that's cool. But yeah, he's kind of done touring, but anyway, he's still a force of nature for sure. Um, but if we look at Ted, so um, the sort of era A that I'm calling, which is a big era, um, which goes into the 60s and, and really into the 70s. This is where I think Ted was at his absolute maximum in terms of punk and attitude. Nobody was like him. He was he was he, he was a complete uh, a breath of fresh air uh, in terms of his guitar playing, what he was playing and this and, and the straight laced uh, uh, lifestyle he was leading. Nobody in hard rock was was quite like Ted. Um but I, but that high punkin attitude quotient doesn't last forever. And we get into the 80s uh, with some of his most commercial albums or commercial sounding albums. I don't know that they over, that they necessarily sold more than, say, the Ted Nugent album, but uh, the overtly popular albums, especially with Damn Yankees. Um, and here I think his punk in, in, in attitude quotient really dips, right? So again, quick, quick summary here. Here's his stuff, the 60s and 70s. So again, I won't go through all this, but that's that includes when he was with the Amboy Dukes in the 60s, when we had Ted Nugent and the Amboy Dukes in the in 74, which was sort of that transition, um, which essentially were the beginning of his solo career, and then his solo career in the 70s and into the 80s, right? Early 80s, right? So that's what I'm calling part A. Here's part B. Again, his least punk in attitude era where he really is becoming quite commercial and it's and and not unique really in a lot of ways. Um, not to say this, these are bad albums necessarily, but there's but but Ted's kind of he's sort of sounding like everybody else in hard rock at this point. A little bit hair metalish too. I kind of hate to say, but kind of that's where he was going. But then I would say thankfully. Uh, he abandons that, and and I think there's sort of a uh, an era C, which is sort of in, you know, in the late into the '90s and into the early 2000s, where he sort of recaptures his punk and attitude approach. He'll never, he was never as punk and attitude as he was in the '70s, because although this is still fairly innovative music that I think he's putting out in this period. Um, it's not a hundred percent unique compared to what he did in the seventies. It's unique to any, but everybody else, but it's not a hundred percent unique from what he did in the seventies. So while his punk and attitude quotient is definitely going up, I don't think we can put it as high as what he did in the seventies because he's self plagiarizing a little bit, but still, it still sounds really fresh and it still sounds very gonzo and it sounds like Ted and like nobody else. Right. So that part's great. And so that's sort of the Spirit of the Wild album, Hunt Music, Crave Man, and probably Love Grenade you could throw in there. But I have to say recently, I think his punk and attitude quotient is tailing off, just like it did with the Ramones, that in the latter part of his career, again, nobody sounds like Ted, but he's starting to sound too much like himself all the time. He's kind of just repeating himself. So his punk and, and attitude quotient is declining. Anyway, that's how I see Ted. Right. In a lot of ways, at least for parts of his career, as punk as anybody. Right. Not many people are going to put it that way. But, hey, you can tell me if you think I'm crazy, if you think that's going too far or if that kind of captures what the Nuge is about. Anyway, if you want more of this and I'm going to even go a little further with Eddie Van Halen and Jimi Hendrix, check the next, ep next episode.
Thanks for thanks for viewing and thanks for your time. All the best to you.